Election day is tomorrow. And yes, Christian, you are obligated to bring your faith to the voting booth. I know there's a lot of scary accusations about Christian nationalism, but let me tell you today what is on the line and why Christians have every right and the responsibility to make sure that we are voting according to our worldview. We will get into all of that today. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Good Ranchers. Go to goodranchers.com slash Allie. That's goodranchers.com slash Allie. All right, everyone, it is election week. It's a big week. It's an exciting week. And honestly, here on Relatable, we haven't spent that much time yet talking about the midterms. I've written about them. I've talked to other people about them. And I've talked on Instagram about them, but we really haven't been dedicating that many episodes exclusively to politics. There's been a lot going on culturally, socially, within the church. There's been some theological discussions that we've had. And so I guess that the midterms kind of just snuck up on me in a way, at least when it comes to the content that we're putting on Relatable. But in another sense, I do think that everything that we've talked about recently it has to do with the election because in one way or another, a lot of these cultural and moral issues that we are discussing, gender, abortion, marriage, family, the moral foundation of our society is on the ballot in some ways explicitly when you're looking at something like Proposition 3 or Proposal 3, rather, in Michigan, abortion is literally on the ballot. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. But in other ways, we're just looking at candidates who either care about the cohesion of the natural family or who don't, who care about the rights of parents to have a say in what their child is learning or just in what the students in their community are learning as they are funding with their taxpayers those education or that education and those who don't. You're looking at politicians who care about your right to operate your business, uh, your child's right to get an in-person education, uh, your right to be able to earn a livelihood without being forced to get a vaccine that you do not want or need. So even though we haven't been talking ex- exclusively or explicitly rather, about the polling and the different uh, data points and analyzing those things leading up to these elections. When we've been talking about these so-called culture wars, we have been talking about the things that are at stake. And that's what I want to talk about a little bit more today and a little bit more specifically today. So Monday before the election, if you have not voted yet, if there is early voting in your state, I encourage you to go ahead, go out and do that. I am a proponent of early voting. The reason that I'm a proponent of it, I know that a lot of people are. And if you're the kind of person that you like the ceremony of going on voting day, on election day, voting in person, all that good stuff, you think it's more secure, I'm totally fine with that. The reason that I'm a proponent of early voting for myself is because I like to know for sure that I've gotten it done because, I mean, there are a million things that could happen in a day that could prevent me from being able to go to our voting location at the time that it's open and cast my vote. There's always a a million different directions that a person, especially a mom, is being pulled in any given day. And I just fear that something would happen, something would overtake my day, could be an emergency, or it could just be responsibilities piling up, and you're unable to fulfill your civic duty on voting day. So I early voted. I did my part just to make sure, absolute sure, that I got it in when I knew that I had a free afternoon. It didn't take long at all. And I have been on a mission for the past past few weeks, I mean, I guess you could say for the past few years of my life, but especially for the past few weeks is I have gone to many universities and talked to many organizations and talked to a lot, a lot of Christians over the past few months. I have been on a mission to convince people who do not typically vote to vote, not just this election cycle, but in the future. And that is part of what I want to do today. So make sure that you share this episode Uh, with those in your life who maybe they just think it doesn't matter, especially as Christians. They think, okay, 
well, Jesus is coming back. Our home is in heaven. Our eyes are on Christ. Our hope is in eternity. Why do we really need to care about politics? Politics is just divisive. It just pulls people apart. And it's not something that you want to uh, get into because you're afraid that it's maybe beneath you as a Christian or it's going to take your eyes off of the eternal and make you focus on the temporal and it's going to breed anxiety and division in your life and in your relationships. And so you just don't want to get into it. Or maybe you think that, hey, your vote doesn't matter. Why does it even why does it even matter if just one person decides to vote or decides not to vote? So I just want to remind you today, Christian, about why it is so important for you to cast your ballot today or tomorrow on election day, why I think it is your responsibility, your right, of course, but also your obligation as a Christian to make sure that you are civically involved. And then we'll talk about some other things I want to uh, that I want to get into some election specific things, respond to some things that we've seen in the media, on TV uh, over the past few days. And so a lot is going to be uh, crammed into this episode, as you can already tell. But before we get into that, before we get into my plea to you for voting, and even if you are voting, by the way, I think that this is just going to reinvigorate you and it's going to re-empower you to ensure that you are involved in every area of government life that you can be and that God is calling you to be. So we'll get into that in a second. But first, let me pause and tell you about our first sponsor for the day. And that is one of my favorite sponsors. I love this time of year because I get to read their advertisements. And that is Operation Christmas Child. Now, a lot of you who have been raised in the church or you've been in in the evangelical church for any amount of time, you know what Operation Christmas Child is. It is around this time every year, you pick up a shoebox or you buy a plastic shoebox at um, at the store and you fill it with different items for kids around the world who don't typically get a Christmas present. And you fill it up with uh, things that are listed on the website, by the way. So uh, toothbrushes, socks, underwear, different toys, maybe crayons, a coloring book, appropriate books, things like that, depending on the gender and the age group uh, that you choose. And then after you fill it up, you bring it to a drop-off spot, and then Samaritan's Purse takes these thousands and thousands and thousands of boxes that Americans make, and they deliver them to children around the world. And the videos and the pictures that I see of these children opening these boxes. I mean, truly just the joy of the Lord on their faces. And it's so easy for us to be a part of it. So I really encourage you to go to SamaritansPurse.org slash OCC to learn more about this. Learn how you can fill a box. This is a great way to teach your kids about generosity and how we put others before ourselves and the joy that comes from giving gifts at Christmas time, not just receiving them. So go to SamaritansPurse.org slash OCC National Collection Week is happening next week, November 14th through the 21st. That'll be the last day that you can drop it off somewhere. So go to SamaritansPurse.org slash OCC. I was speaking at a nonprofit organization over the weekend in Georgia, and it is um, an organization that's just starting. It's going to provide housing and other resources for women who are pregnant, who find themselves in situations of uh, crisis, poverty, destitution, going to provide a refuge for them and a platform for them uh, to be able to um, start the rest of their lives and to really change their lives in a very healthy direction so that they can um, be there for their children. And so just an amazing organization. And I had the privilege of speaking uh, of speaking to them over the weekend. And one thing that I encouraged them in as we are heading into this election week and something that I have been talking about every time I speak really for the past few months, is uh, what an example we have in the overturning of Roe v. Wade that politics matter. Wow, politics matter. I mean, if you look at what led up to 
the overturning of Roe, the publishing of the Dobbs decision. We are looking at six different justices appointed by three different presidents over a span of 30 years that finally led to a decision uh, that has allowed for states to pass just laws recognizing the dignity and the humanity and therefore the human rights of life inside the womb. I mean, we're talking about 30 years of trying to elect the right president to appoint the right justices that will make the right decision on behalf of the unborn. And then it goes back even farther than that. It goes back all the way to 1973. So really, we're looking at 49 years. We're looking at 49 years of people showing up and speaking out, of protesting, of lobbying, of electing the right legislators it, for our state representative, for state senators who are going to write laws and try to pass laws that would then make their way to the Supreme Court in the hopes that the Supreme Court would take up their case and then effectively overturn Roe v. Wade. That was 49 years of persistence, 49 years of perseverance, 49 years of pro-lifers trying to change people's mind, trying to put the right people in power so the right laws would be written to make a just decision on behalf of the unborn. We're talking five decades of patience. I mean, that is incredible. I think a lot of times we think in our just microwave mentality, especially that we have in my generation and the younger generation, is that things have to change this election cycle for them to change at all. Or we expect things to change quickly. They're going to change in the next six months. They're going to change in the next six years. Whatever it is, we want things to happen quickly. And of course we do. I think that's normal. But what we don't realize is that change doesn't happen all at once. Change happens over time. Change happens over sometimes five decades of millions and millions of people, in this case, pro-lifers, simply dedicating their time and their resources and their energy to ensuring that people are put into place to write just laws that would then make their way to the Supreme Court and then put in place in the executive branch, someone that would pick the justices to make that just decision. So much went into this over the course of 50 years. And then in the state of Mississippi, pro-lifers, after 49 years of hard work, put the right legislators in place that wrote a law banning abortion at 15 weeks that then finally made its way to the Supreme Court. And then we had it, the overturning of Roe v. Wade, the Dobbs decision that, again, allowed states to pass laws that recognize this basic and primary human right to simply not be murdered as an innocent person. I mean, praise God for that. And I know there was so much misinformation that came out after it. It was vitriolic. There was There were attacks on pregnancy centers. There were threats of violence, threats of terrorism. As far as I know, no arrests have been made for that terrorism against the pro-life, against these pro-life pregnancy centers. And yet, I know that it, that was a scary and intense time. In a lot of ways, it still is. A lot of people are still believing the propaganda that the laws on the books are preventing miscarriage care or preventing the care of ectopic pregnancies or preventing women's lives from being saved. But as we have gone through many times, and we'll link these past episodes, that is not true of any legislation on the books right now. It does not prevent the care of miscarriages. It does not prevent the care of a woman in order to save her life. There could be misunderstanding from the doctors. There could be, in some cases, uh, malice going on here in order to make a political point. But that is not the fault of the laws that make exceptions for the life of the mother that ensure procedures can be done in order to take care of ectopic pregnancies and miscarriages. That is not the fault of the legislation that is simply recognizing the life of an unborn child to live. So that's what politics got us. That's what politics got us. After 49 years of pro-lifers voting the right way, of doing the right thing, of pushing their legislators, of changing hearts and minds. That's why politics mattered, because after 49 years of legal 
and in many cases, unfettered slaughter of human beings made in the image of God. Finally, after the persistence of people unafraid of getting their hands dirty in the political arena, a just decision was made so just laws could be written. That's why politics matters. It's a matter of life and death for the most vulnerable people among us. That's why it matters that you vote. That's why it matters that you don't sit on the couch and just complain about the state of our country. That's why it matters that you get involved. And of course, it's not just that. If you listen to this podcast, you know that there are a lot of things on the line. But with abortion, I mean, we are literally looking at a matter of life and death. You are literally looking at a vote having the power to prevent children from going to the slaughter, being sacrificed to Malak. And so it's not just, of course, politics. Underneath the politics of abortion uh, over the past 49 years, there has been incredible, unseen and unsung work by Christians done to help vulnerable women, vulnerable dads, their babies, to help these families. I know you hear a lot, we can't vote for a pro-life candidate or we can't advocate for pro-life legislation until we're doing the work for these women. Look, the work is already being done. The work has been done for the past 49 years. The very Christians that the left demonizes, the very pro-lifers, that the left says don't care, the very pregnancy centers that the left terrorizes. They have been doing the work for the past 50 years that the left says is not being done. The work is being done on behalf of these vulnerable populations. People have been showing up every day for the past 50 years to the pregnancy centers, to the pro-life organizations, to the nonprofits, that are working on behalf of these vulnerable populations to make sure that they have the resources, to make sure that they have refuge from abuse, to make sure that they have a place to live, a place to stay, to make sure that they have education, that they have parenting classes. If they want to give their child up for adoption, these pregnancy centers and organizations, make sure that they can do that. If they need someone to take care of them, to take care of their child, to help them get a job, to help them with the immigration process, to help them with the welfare process, Christians have been showing up for the past 50 years doing that. Do not allow your delusions about what work is not or is being done prevent you from voting righteously on behalf of the unborn Christian. It's not an excuse. If you are worried that the work is not being done, and if you sincerely have looked in your area and you've looked for the pregnancy centers, you've looked for the nonprofit organizations, and you truly feel in your community that there is nothing being done, for pregnant women who are trying to keep their children or who are facing the choice of abortion. If you truly feel like there is no opportunity for these women whatsoever and that the only choice they realistically have in destitute situations is to abort their child, that is still not an excuse to vote on behalf of murder. It is not. That is your calling. That is, that is what you should take as a hint that maybe you need to get up and do something. If the work is not being done, that doesn't mean that you get to vote for abortion. If the work is not being done, then you need to do the work, right? That's what we're called to do. And so while I say politics matter because policy matters, because people matter, and I absolutely believe that, I mean, it is so important. It is okay, by the way, to be a one-issue voter if your issue is abortion. Totally fine. People say, oh, no, that shouldn't be your one issue. What is a better issue? What is a better issue than to vote on behalf of babies living? Um, I say that politics matter for that reason, but gosh, what is underneath our politics also matters. It also matters the work that we are doing on a daily basis, how we are helping these vulnerable moms and dads and babies and these families in crisis to make sure that we are providing for them in every spiritual and material way that we possibly can without, by the way, uh, voting for the government to force money out of other people's pockets to 
pay for these people. Really, like we should be voluntarily, charitably, happily, generously doing everything that we can with our energy and our resources to helping uh, these families. That is also our call. And so it's not one or the other. I know people say, well, I can either um, I can either focus on personal evangelism and personal help and making sure that these people are taken care of and sharing the gospel, or I can be a political activist. Look, I'm not even asking you to be a political activist. I'm just showing you that we need both, that both are a way to love your neighbor. Politics is not the exclusive way to love your neighbor. It's not even maybe the primary way to love your neighbor, but it is a way to love your neighbor. Politics matter because policy matters because people matter. If you look at Jeremiah 29, and I think we talked about this recently, I did an episode, a most misused episode on Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. I use that verse as a most misused verse because it very often is decontextualized and it's used to basically say that God is never going to allow anything bad to happen to you and anything bad that happens to you is because he doesn't like you or because you fell out of his favor and you disobeyed him. And so sometimes it's used in a very anti-biblical and anti-gospel way. And so I wanted to look at the context um, of that verse, which is that verse is not the point of what I'm about to say, but one of the verses that we read in Jeremiah 29, um, it is um, it is to a people in exile. It is to God's people who are in exile in Babylon. And what God tells his people is while you are in exile, while you are in exile, seek the welfare of the city in which you dwell. Seek the welfare of the place that I in which I've placed you. And we as Christians who are exiles in this world are also called to seek the welfare of the place in which God has providentially and specifically and purposely placed us. First Peter 2.11, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. We are exiles. In this world, we are sojourners in this world, and our citizenship is ultimately in heaven. But that doesn't negate our earthly citizenship, and that does not diminish our civic duty. Because, yes, our hope is in heaven. Yes, our heart, our eyes, our focus is on eternity. Yes, we long for the day when there are no more politics, there is no more partisanship, when there's no more culture wars. And everyone will know truth because every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So everyone will know that in Jesus, in God, there is truth. Of course, we long for that day, but we're not there yet. We're not there yet. And we're not just here to take up space. We're not just here to complain. We are here to do something. There are lots of things that we are called to do outside of politics. Of course, politics shouldn't be our God. We don't trust in princes. We don't trust in horses. We don't think that any politician left or right is going to be able to save our country. It is going to be by his grace that any good legislation comes down or anything good happens to this country. But Again, we have to understand that we are in the here and the now. God has placed you in the United States of America at this time in history, on this speck of eternity, specifically and purposely and providentially, not accidentally, not arbitrarily. And your goal, your purpose, as it is for all Christians, is to glorify him in everything that you think, everything that you say, everything that you do, and part of our blessed responsibility and right and privilege as Americans um, is to be able to have a say in our elections, to be able to shape our governance, to shape the future of our country in a way that seeks the welfare of our neighbors. And I've got a little bit more to say about what exactly I mean by seeking the welfare and the interests of our neighbors, because as you can probably guess, there are Christians who disagree on what exactly that means. But let me pause and tell you about our next sponsor, and that is Patriot Mobile. 
All right. Patreon Mobile is America's only Christian conservative mobile phone provider. It's a force for conservative values. They are fighting for the principles, the values that you and I believe in, things like free speech and life and parental rights and education. We are tired in our house of giving money to corporations that are turning around and using our dollars to fund politicians and fund causes that are working directly against us. So why not give your money to another company that is fighting alongside you rather than opposition to you? Patriot Mobile has affordable plans for you, your family, even your business. They offer the same nationwide coverage as the major carriers because they use multiple major networks. Plus, you're supporting conservative values with every call. Go to patriotmobile.com slash Allie. You'll get free activation when you do. Patriotmobile.com slash Allie. Use offer code Allie. Special discounts for veterans and first responders. Patriotmobile.com slash Allie. So obviously there is going to be debate and in good faith debate about what it looks like to seek the best interest of our neighbors through politics as Christians. And there are issues that the Bible doesn't explicitly speak to. There are issues that Christians, Christian, two Christians who believe fully in the gospel, who believe in the inerrancy of scripture, who believe in the absolute authority of God over the universe, and they are still going to disagree on things. Like what immigration policy should look like, uh, what restrictions on gun ownership should look like. There are a variety of issues that two Christians who absolutely and sincerely love the Lord can disagree on. And yet there are some issues, all of which, as I said a few minutes ago, are on the ballot in one way or another, uh, that Christians really cannot disagree on. I'm not saying that disagreement on these issues means that one person is not a Christian, but that one person is wrong. Now, we can be sincere Christians, saved Christians, and be wrong on a lot of things. That's part of sanctification. There are things that I thought a few years ago that I realized were wrong. That doesn't mean that I wasn't a Christian then. It just means that I was wrong. And so there are things that the Bible does explicitly address that if Christians disagree on this, One Christian supports it. One Christian is against it. One of the Christians is wrong. And some of those issues are found in the very first chapter of the Bible. So Christians believe, and this is something I wrote for World Magazine today. I'll link the the article in the description of this episode so you can share it if you'd like. Christians believe that God made the world and everything in it. That's Genesis 1-1. We believe that God is the source of truth, of justice, of righteousness, and love. That's Psalm 89, 14. Therefore, we believe that his ways are better. They're better because he made all of it. That means he's the authority over all of it. That means he's the arbiter of truth. That means he's the determinant of right and wrong. He is the source and the giver of all things good. There is no good and no truth and no beauty outside of him. If we believe that his ways are better, we believe that they're better for ourselves, that they're better for our neighbors, they're better for our nation. And since God is love, I will never outlove him. I will never outlove God by disagreeing with him. Not just in what I say, not just in what I do, but also in how I vote. I will never love my neighbor and seek their interest through my vote if I am voting in a way that opposes God's order. And we see what God's order is on a few issues, on a few fundamental issues in the very first chapter of the Bible. In fact, in one particular verse of the Bible, and that is Genesis 1.27, that God made us in his image, male and female, he created us. That right there tells us what we need to know about human value, what we know about the gender binary, and the structure of marriage and the family. To vote against these things is to vote for disorder, because God is the creator of order. He is the creator and the source of all things good. So to vote for any policy or any politician who is against the God who is love, the God who is the creator, the God who is the source of truth, it is to vote against what he says 
is good and right and true, which is both unjust and unloving. If I believe that the God is, God is the authority over all things and he gave us everything that is good and he knows better than I do and he tells us who human beings are, what marriage is, why life is valuable because we are made in his image, then I am never going to love my neighbor or seek their interest well if I am voting against those things, if I am voting for disorder, if I am voting for a new definition of the family, a new definition of marriage, a new definition of when life begins. That's basically me saying that I think I know better than God or politicians know better than God, that maybe we can create something better than what God has created. Maybe by voting for disorder, voting against God's order, I can love people better than God loves them. And that's blasphemy. So I just can't do that. I'm not saying that any political party is perfect. Certainly no politician is perfect, but I at the very least refuse to vote against God's order when it comes to what he thinks about when life begins, what he thinks about the value of life, which again, we see in that verse that we are made in his image. We're not clumps of cells. Human beings at any stage are not clumps of cells, that we are made male or we are made female, that is determined by our biology that he has given us, that marriage is between one man and one one woman. That's what the family structure is supposed to be, which obviously, as we see in this creation account, is the foundation of society. I can't vote against that if I love my neighbor. I, I can't. I can't vote against that if I care about my country. Because I believe that God's ways are better. And I will never outlove him. I will never outjustice him. I will never outcompassion him. I will never outsmart him, outwisdom him. So the most loving thing that I can do is agree with God in word and deed and in vote. And I understand that a lot of people say, Ooh, that's Christian nationalism. That's so scary. And Again, you should read my article um, about that because I do address that accusation of if Christian nationalism is what some people call Christian nationalism, then I agree it's unbiblical, unconstitutional, or both. But if Christian nationalism is simply Christians voting in accordance with the belief that God created the world and everything in it, um, then that pejorative of, well, you're just a Christian nationalist is really meaningless. It's really meaningless because that's what Christians have to do. We can't compartmentalize God's authority. We can't pretend that politics is somehow independent of the belief that God is sovereign over everything, that there is no, as R.C. Sproul used to say, maverick molecule. We can't separate our faith from how we vote. And you understand secular progressives don't, and they're never asked to. They bring their worldview to the voting booth. They use it to shape curriculum. They use it to write laws. But for some reason, when Christians bring our faith to the voting booth or try to infuse God's truth into every sphere we occupy, we're fascists, we're uh, totalitarians in some way, we're Christian nationalists. All of those things, all of those accusations are manipulation tactics to ensure that the only people who do not allow their faith and their worldview to characterize their vote is Christian conservatives. It's not Stacey Abrams who is being called a Christian nationalist for saying that she's running in the spirit of Deborah. It's not Gavin Newsom being called a Christian nationalist for using a Bible verse to try to advertise to women in red states to come to California and kill their babies. It's not Christian nationalism when you have almost every black pastor, it seems, in America that I've seen on Twitter say that you need to vote. uh, You need to vote Democrats from the pulpit. Apparently, it's not Christian nationalism when people like Raphael Warnock say that it is the Christian and righteous thing to do to vote on behalf of abortion, or when Kamala Harris says the same thing. We never hear that that's Christian nationalism. Those people are never accused of trying to push a theocracy. It's only when Christian conservatives say, cite Psalm 139 to say, you know what, I don't think I can vote against the slaughter of babies that God purposely created in the womb, that all of a sudden we're on the precipice of the handmaid's tale. So you see the hypocrisy there, that it has nothing to do with them thinking that no one should bring their worldview to the voting booth. It's only about yours. It's only about your politics. It's only because they disagree with your morality. And so they use 
extortion, manipulation tactics to make you think that you are the only group of people who cannot allow your worldview to shape your political view, and that doesn't make any sense. It's not scary Christian nationalism, whatever you want to call it, to vote in accordance to what God's word says. You're not forcing people to believe in Christ. You're not forcing people to go to church with you. You're not forcing people to say Jesus is Lord. This is not a theocracy. This is voting in accordance with what we know God's way is and understanding and believing that God's way and that God's order is better. And by the way, that's what everyone else is doing too, according to what they believe is right and what their worldview is. So it's not Christian nationalism. It's simply being a Christian. It's simply what Christianity is is believing and speaking and living and voting as if God is the creator of the heavens and the earth and that he knows better than us. And he does. So that's my pitch to you. That's my pitch to you to vote. That's my pitch to you uh, to vote in accordance with Christian values, to never vote against God's order when it comes to the value of life inside the womb, Um, when it comes to uh, the reality of gender, the definition of the family and marriage. And I'm going to link some past episodes in this description of this episode so you can go listen to them. Put them on two times if you have to. If you're like, wow, this is the first time I'm hearing this stuff and I never knew that I should vote. I've never thought about these issues. Um, I want you to inform yourself. Just pick a few. Like I, I'll categorize them. Like listen to a couple on abortion. Listen to a couple on gender. Listen to like one or two on marriage. Uh, listen to just a couple on what like Democrats versus Republicans believe, and I'll provide those for you. Listen to them. Listen to them as quickly as you can. Think about them. Pray about it and make sure that you vote tomorrow. And by the way, because I know that the vast majority of people listening to this are already voting, um, share this with your friends, but also Go out to your friends right now. Text your friends. Call your friends. Have a conversation with them. It's uncomfortable, but there's a lot on the line. There's a lot on the line right now. And like, for example, we'll talk about this a little bit more uh, in a second. In some states, like lives are on the line, as we spoke about when it comes to abortion. There's a lot at stake. So make sure that your friends who are on the fence, who are apathetic, who are overly busy, make it as easy for them as possible to vote. Uh, Make it really easy uh, for them to be able to show up. So if you need to babysit their kids, if you need to make them dinner, if you need to pick them up, if you need to take them from work to where they need to go, uh, if you need to make sure that they have lunch because they don't have time, the only time that they have to vote tomorrow is on their lunch break and they got to eat, bring them lunch, whatever you have to do. As I'm saying this, I'm racking my brain and I'm like, okay, who in my life do I need to make sure has voted and how can I make that as easy as possible for them? But I think that that's one role that we can play in this as people who understand that politics matter because policy matters because people matter. And at the voting booth is how we raise a respectful uh, ruckus. All right, I'm going to talk about a couple of these proposals and just a couple of my predictions. And if we have time, I'm going to respond to a couple clips that I saw last week from Trump and The View. But let me pause and tell you about our next sponsor, and that is Annie's Kit Club. So this would be a great gift for your kids, especially if you think that your kid might be a little more artistic, or maybe you wish that they would explore that side of them, or maybe you just want your kid to be able to spend their downtime in a way that is more productive and constructive than just in front of the TV or playing video games. You need to check out Annie's Kit Club. It is a subscription craft service. And so every month shows up to your front door in a box with all the supplies, all the instructions for a craft kids eight and up can make. They've got jewelry making. They've got woodworking kits. They've got stuff for boys and girls. They've got STEM projects. And so all kinds of things to help your child develop their problem solving skills, uh, their creativity. It's really a great service. Plus you can cancel anytime. If you figure out it doesn't really work for you and your family, there's no long-term contracts or anything like that, but I know that you're going to love it. So go to annieskitclubs.com slash Allie. Get your first month 75% off. That's annieskitclubs.com slash Allie for 75% off your first month. annieskitclubs.com slash Allie.
All right, so I've alluded to this a couple times now, and a lot of you guys have asked me about it, and we don't have time to get into the nitty gritty. I'm just, and you can read it. We can link it in the description of this episode. You can read it for yourself. But Michigan Proposal 3, the Right to Reproductive Freedom Initiative, which of course is a misnomer as a lot of proposals and bills are, it has nothing to do with reproductive freedom. Everyone in this country has the freedom to reproduce. Uh, People like me who are pro-life care about what happens specifically after reproduction. So you've already made your free choice to reproduce. Now we would say that you shouldn't be allowed to kill the product of that reproduction, which happens to be a unique human being with unique DNA. And therefore, because it is a unique human being at the point of conception, it is also entitled to human rights, just like you and me, the foremost being the right to life. And so this Michigan Proposal 3 and uh, this Michigan Proposal 3 provides a state constitutional right to reproductive freedom. Again, a euphemism, which is defined as, quote, the right to make and effectuate decisions Uh, about all matters relating to pregnancy, including but not limited to prenatal care, childbirth, postpartum care, contraception, sterilization, abortion care, miscarriage management, and infertility care. So there's a lot in there, as you can probably tell, that's very general and overarching and far-reaching language that no doubt is going to have a lot of consequences that are not explicitly listed in this proposal. But one thing that we know for sure is that this is trying to solidify the so-called right to abortion without restriction. So under this proposal, there would be virtually no restriction on a woman's uh, decision to abort her baby through all nine months of pregnancy. Because if this is seen as a human right, then the state is not going to violate uh, that human right, except for maybe for very specific and, and rare reasons, exceptional reasons. And so this solidifies the ability of a doctor to dismember a child, to poison a child, to stop the heart of a child by injecting poison into its heart while she is wiggling in her mother's womb. That's something that happens thousands of times a day. That's not fear-mongering. That actually is what a second trimester abortion is. Again, we have talked about explicitly what abortion is many times, and I encourage you to actually know what the procedure is and does that Michigan is saying this is a right. Of course, it's not a right to kill an innocent human being. Of course, it's not. And yet in Michigan, they're trying to say that it is. And if you reelect Governor Whitmer instead of the Republican challenger, Tudor Dixon, who I think is an excellent candidate, by the way, you are going to get an advocate for this atrocious and brutal and godless uh, procedure of abortion. And then, of course, we also know in Michigan, we've got children's education on the line. Governor Whitmer was one of the most draconian governors during COVID. She shut down schools. She shut down businesses. She prevented people from being able to go to the store and buy seeds so that they could plant their gardens and grow their own food. I mean, she really was one of the harshest leaders, and she was hailed by Democrats as one of the best. In a recent debate with Tudor Dixon, She said, oh, schools were only shut down for three months, which is absolutely not true. That's actually a lie. And thank the Lord that Tudor Dixon uh, called her out on this, because the fact is, in some areas of Michigan, there are schools uh, that only recently opened back up. And by the way, even if it had only been three months, you cannot get those three months back. That's still significant, by the way. And so her arrogance of just brushing off the consequences, in some cases, the lifelong consequences of robbing our kids, not just the education, but the social development, the emotional development that comes from being able to have normal social um, experiences uh, that very often come with school. I mean, a lot of these kids are never going to recover. And of course, that's not a knock on homeschooling. 
homeschooling provides all of those opportunities as well. But for the kids who were robbed of their education suddenly during COVID, they didn't just go have like a normal, healthy homeschool experience. Uh, They were forced into their homes, forced to virtually learn. In many cases, they didn't learn at all because they didn't have parents who were either willing or able to kind of make sure that they were staying on track. And so they really did lose the development and lose the education and the learning that came from that. Some of those kids were forced into a depression or an an isolation induced depression, anxiety, suicide, abuse rates went up because of these policies that were put into place to basically force people into their homes by closing down businesses and schools. There was a story that I'm an article that I'm sure you saw in the Atlantic uh, that said that we need amnesty, that all of the people who were way too harsh in forcing the vaccines and forcing school shutdowns and forcing businesses to close down, just killing the economy in so many places, killing people in a lot of cases. If we're looking at the rates of suicide and the rates of um, of opioid use and opioid overdose, that we just need to kind of forgive those people. And look, there is forgiveness in a sense, but there shouldn't be forgetfulness, especially when you go to the voting booth, because a lot of these policymakers, they kept on making these decisions, especially Whitmer, while they were doing something else themselves. Whitmer was saying, you can't enjoy your freedom. You can't have a normal life. But she was. She and her husband were traveling, even as she told everyone else to stay inside. I mean, it was the same thing with Lori Lightfoot in Chicago. It was the same thing with Muriel Bowser uh, in D.C. It was the same thing with Gavin Newsom in California. It was the same thing with these Democrats across the country who said, freedom for me, but not for thee. So, yes, of course, there's grace and forgiveness from the Christian, but there should not be forgetfulness when you are going to the voting booth that these people took away your freedoms. They want you to forget about it. You can't. And by the way, they would do it again tomorrow. Kathy Hochul in New York, that's another gubernatorial race that I'll be looking at. Very interesting. A lot closer than it should be in New York because New York is so deeply blue. She said in a recent debate against Lee Zeldin, Um, that she would do it all again. She would fire all of the nurses who refused to get the COVID jab Um, again. Can you believe that? And so they're not remorseful at all. Do not vote for people who, God forbid, another disaster strikes, would take away your freedoms tomorrow, have learned nothing from COVID, do not care about your grandmother or your mother who died alone, do not care that you weren't able to... Uh, get married with your friends and family there during COVID who do not care that you weren't able to hold a funeral service for your dad who died, who do not care that your child can't read even though he's in fourth grade because he lost two years of normal school, who do not care that your special needs child has now regressed because he was unable to get in-person learning and he doesn't understand what what his speech therapist is saying with the mask on. They do not care about those consequences. They don't care how much you're suffering. They don't care that you lost your business of 30 years. These politicians, Democrat politicians, for the most part, do not care that their policies destroyed your life. They would do it again tomorrow. Remember that as you vote. Remember that. Remember that inflation in the United States, while it is global for the most part, it is being made worse by politicians in charge who are spending money that we do not have. The gas prices are as high as they are because of energy policy that is being purposely decided upon by the Democrats who are in charge, who are openly hostile and adversarial to drilling on our own land, to fracking, to the oil industry. And so the reason that you can't make ends meet right now The reason that you are struggling, the reason that you are aghast every time that you go to the grocery store and you look at the receipt and you can't believe how much it costs to feed a family of four, remember, those are the those are the consequences of policies that have been deliberately put in place. The reason why you don't feel safe to ride on the subway anymore, the reason why you used to be able to go to Seattle with your family and spend a wonderful Sunday afternoon there, but now you feel worried, the reason that 
Portland is decimated. The reason why San Francisco is a hellscape that no one wants to visit. The reason why Austin and Denver and Philadelphia and D.C. and New York and all of these major once beautiful cities are now crap that people don't want to live in, that people are moving out of, is because of progressive policies. It's because of Democrats. You cannot find a city in the country That has improved because of Democrat policies. In fact, all of them have become markedly worse, less safe, dirtier, poorer over the past few years because of policies masquerading as social justice, equity and equality, but bring nothing but destruction. Don't vote Democrats. Let's just be explicit about that. There's really no good reason to, especially as a Christian, but really as a thinking person. There's no good reason. Do not buy the fear mongering propaganda that you're saving democracy. Come on, come on. All right, I don't have time to react to the clips that I wanted to react to. We've got to get out here, but let me tell you about Birch Gold. So I just told you about a lot of the instability in our world and a lot of what is at stake, um, and you just want to make sure that your savings are secure. So text Allie to 989-898 for your free info kit on diversifying into gold with Birch Gold. Plus, when you do it this month by Black Friday, you get a free gold bar with every purchase that you make by December 22nd. With almost 20 years experience converting IRAs and 401ks into precious metals IRAs, Birch Gold can help you. So text Allie to 989-898. You'll get your free info kit on gold. You can learn more about it, see if it's right for you. Secure your future with gold. All right, guys, we'll have a fun episode tomorrow. I'll react to some of the clips that I saw from Trump rally and from The View over the past few days. I have a lot more to say than I did today, and yet I have to I have to cut us off. Make sure, though, that you watch the election coverage on blazetv.com. Com. It will be live election coverage. It'll be me, Glenn Beck, Jason Whitlock, Steve Dace, all of your favorite Blaze TV, uh, Blaze TV hosts will be live on election night tomorrow night. We'll have a lot of fun things to say. I'm super excited about it. Election night is always really fun, stressful, uh, but fun. So if you're like, oh, I don't have any friends that care about this or want to talk about this. You can join me, girl. You can join me. Go to blazetv.com slash midterms. That's blazetv.com slash midterms. Plus, you can subscribe to Blaze TV using Red Wave as your promo code for $30 off your Blaze TV subscription. All right, guys, I'll see you tomorrow on Relatable. Then I'll see you tomorrow night. You're going to see me a lot this week because I'll have a lot to say about everything going on. Thanks for listening. See you guys tomorrow. 